Hello, welcome to Florida Train Academy's channel. In today's video, we're going to be practicing 50 multiple choice exam questions to help you pass the CNA examination, regardless of the state that you're in. Um, so there are usually two different companies that provide the CNA testing. It's either going to be Prometric or Pearson View. Regardless, each test consists of a portion um, that actually has questions. And so we have, for the last 15 years, helped thousands of students pass their CNA examinations so they can earn their license it's as a nursing assistant and we hope to be able to help you also so let us go ahead and begin number one mrs jones has trouble chewing and swallowing what type of diet should she be prescribed mechanical soft diet clear liquid diet low sodium diet or a bland diet and so if someone's having problems chewing that means they can't get their food into small enough bites in order to swallow it safely so this person may or may not have their dentures that'll be one of the first things i'm thinking of and so if you are a cna you want to report this to the nurse and one of the first diet modifications that we would request from the physician would be to change this person's diet to a mechanical soft diet Usually after a surgery or if we allow their stomach to rest, we'll usually have them on a clear liquid diet. A bland diet is for somebody who can't take the excess flavors. Maybe they have acid reflux. And then the other option was a low sodium diet. And a low sodium diet doesn't matter if we're giving a person large bites of food. So mechanical soft, instead of giving them a hamburger, the dietitian will instead send them like a Salisbury steak. It's still beef with some gravy on it. So it's more tender and easier to swallow. So the correct answer was A. Number two, Mrs. Watson cried when you were helping her get dressed. What should you do? A, ignore her and continue to help her with dressing. B, let her know it is all right to cry and that you are there for her if she wants to talk. C, tell her she doesn't need to cry. You're not hurting her. D, tell her that if she's going to cry, she can dress herself. What do you think is the best response? And B is correct. Let her know it's all right to cry and that you are there if for her if she wants to talk. And so active communication, um, you know, don't try to stop her from crying. Maybe you can talk to her and um, calm her, ease her pain just through communication and relaxation techniques, such as tell her to take a deep breath in and out and reassure her that, you know, the dressing process will be done, you know, quickly. Let's go to question three. Question three, which one of the following is the strongest form of communication? Tactile, which is touch, verbal, written, or silence? If you chose silence, you're absolutely correct. Remember, silence forces you to be quiet and it helps you get your message across in fewer words. Um, and then as far as your patients, when you're communicating with them, if you're talking at the same time they're talking, we're not really communicating. So one of you all need to be actively listening and you can listen to what's being said better when you're being silent. Number four, who is responsible for maintaining a clean facility? Housekeeping, the CNA, maintenance, or all of the above? And this is an easy one. Everyone is responsible for keeping a facility clean, including the nurses. We all work together. We're on the same team. Let's keep the facility clean and safe for our patients. Number five, Mr. Blake is blind. What is the best way to communicate with him? Tell Mr. Blake your name when you're entering his room. Enter quietly and touch him before you speak. Speak loudly. D, none of the above. All right, and this is an easy one also. It's going to be A, tell Mr. Blake your name when you're entering his room. Don't forget to knock first. Of course, knock and introduce yourself. Hello, Mr. Blake. My name is Eunice. I'm going to be your CNA today. I'm going to be your nurse today. Um, and then let them know the reason that you're actually in the room. Number six, Mrs. Watson is in a wheelchair. She keeps attempting to stand up. The best way to ensure her safety is A, use a seat belt to strap her in, B, use a lap buddy, C, use a wheelchair alarm, or D, use a tray table so she can't get up. I need for you to try to ensure her safety with 
without um, actually causing her to be restrained because she did not have an order for a restraint. So the best option is going to be C, use a wheelchair alarm. All of the other devices actually formulate some type of restraint where the person can't get up freely and that could actually result in a, a you know a neglect or an abuse charge so you want to be really careful with using tray tables and other items to force your patients to remain in one spot if the tray table is normally used for feeding time and the person is not currently eating technically that tray table should be moved away so the person can move more freely we want this person to remain safe. So the best thing to do at this point is to use that wheelchair alarm until we can get an order from a physician um, for a restraint or less is more. Um, maybe the physician will actually order a sitter. Okay, someone who could be a companion. Number seven, when can a restraint be used? A, when a resident falls out of the bed. B, with a doctor's order. C, when the resident is abusive. D, when the resident is demanding. And you, I just gave you this answer. We can only use a restraint B with a doctor's order. And let me just continue. We don't restrain people because they fall. Um, when you restrain someone, you actually increase their chances of injury. You increase their chances of falling because their goal is going to be to get up. So that's why we utilize those unlicensed persons such as sitters and companions who can stay in the room with the person or we're going to ask the family member to come in because we don't want to be tying our residents down. Number eight, a CNA must wear gloves when she is A, performing ROM or range of motion, B, helping a resident to eat, C, washing a resident's hair, D, shaving a resident. And I know some of you are like, I'm wearing gloves for all of those. I want you to think about the one skill that is the most contaminating. And the one that's going to be the most contaminating that's going to put you at risk of um, being around bloodborne pathogens is going to be D, shaving the resident. So I know you probably want to wear gloves when performing every skill, but glove use for every skill is not necessary. Glove use for the contaminating skills is necessary. Nine, a draw sheet is used to A, reposition the resident, B, keep the bottom sheet dry, C, be an extra cushion for the resident, D, none of the above. And a draw sheet is a folded sheet that we put sometimes under a patient so they can have their chucks or their protective padding and then they would have a draw sheet beneath that. Not all facilities allow draw sheets because the more fabric, the more material you have under a patient, the more likely it's to cause wrinkles, which will then lead to bed sores. So we're talking about bed, we're talking about the draw sheets, but most of the facilities I've worked at do not allow you to use them. If your facility does, it's usually so that you can help reposition the patient. Instead of pulling on the patient, you actually should have two people, one on either side. You lift on your side and then you can move your patient up in bed. Number 10, the first sign of skin breakdown is A, warmth, B, discoloration, C, tingling. I think it says tangling there. Or D, bleeding. What is the first sign of a skin breakdown? And if you said discoloration, you're absolutely correct. A lot of your textbooks are geared toward a Western population. So they may say that redness is the first sign of a pressure sore. I teach so many students and I, I try to advocate for all complexions. Most brown people don't turn red. So if it's something that looks dusky, something that doesn't have the same appearance as the surrounding skin, that could be an area where a person has either laid too long or an area that's wet. And that would be a spot that a pressure sore would start. And so whenever you see something that is discolored, please let your nurse know. 11, all of the following are ways to prevent weight loss except, so we're looking for the exception, helping the resident prepare for meals, making sure the resident eats fast before the food gets cold, helping a resident who has trouble feeding themselves, knowing a resident's food preferences, so all of the following are ways to prevent weight loss, except B, making sure the resident eats fast before the food gets cold. 
Number 12, Mr. Jones is on an IV, some type of intravenous fluid. What is the certified nursing assistant's responsibility? A, insert in an IV line, care of the IV site, C, reporting any changes or problems, D, removing an IV line. And for the CNA examination, you're not a patient care tech. You're not anyone who has hospital training. So I don't want to hear about your cousin, Joe, who works in a hospital in Montana with a CNA license and he's drawing blood and doing all this other stuff. This is not that type of test. You are a basic caregiver. And so what you're going to do is C, you're going to report any changes or problems to the nurse who will then assess that IV site. 13. Mr. Jackson is to be brought by wheelchair to the x-ray department. You have covered Mr. Jackson with a robe and blanket. You have maintained Mr. Jackson's A, right to good nursing care, B, right to privacy, C, right to refuse care, or D, right to confidentiality. And anytime you're covering a resident during a bath, you want to make sure that you only expose the areas that need to be area. Um, you want to only expose the areas that need to be exposed. So um, the best answer is going to be B. That way you can maintain their right to privacy. 14. A resident refuses to take his medication. The CNA should. And I actually left this question here because as of July 1st in the state of Florida, a CNA in long-term care facilities can administer medications. It's called a, a qualified medical assistant. And so normally prior to this, CNAs were not to be given medications. Um, some facilities were doing it, but now we actually have a state law that allows it. So let me go back to number 14. Um, a resident refuses to take his medication. The CNA should, A, tell him to take his medications right now. B, have another CNA hold him while you give him the medication. C, take the medication back to the charge nurse. D, call the doctor. And the correct answer is C, take the medication back to the charge nurse. Maybe the nurse will be able to get the patient to take their medication, and then the nurse would be ultimately responsible for notifying the doctor of that patient's refusal. Um, you make sure you document um, that you included the nurse in the um, with, with this particular situation. Question number 15, when bathing an unconscious resident, you should not wash the resident's hair, check for bed sores, wash the perineal area from front to back or none of the above. And actually you should do all of these. <laughs> um, when you're taking care of someone who's unconscious, you may not wash their hair with every bath, but you do need to wash their hair. You're always checking for bed sores and then you want to wash their private area from front to back or the perineal area. So the one that you should not do is actually D, because all of these would be correct responses. All right, so D, none of the above. 16, the job of an occupational therapist is to A, help the patient learn to walk again. B, help the patient learn to use their hands again. C, help the patient with the hearing problems or D, help the patient with a sight problem. And whenever you think of an occupational therapist, I want you to think about somebody who may have Parkinson's disease and they usually have tremors. It may be hard for them to eat or feed themselves because they have a neurological condition. We're gonna call a specialist in to help this person either use adaptive equipment like anti-shake spoons or to help them have better control over their fine motor skills in their hands. And so that particular person would be an occupational therapist. And so the answer is going to be B. An occupational therapist helps the patient learn how to use their hands again. Um, it would not be um, A, a physical therapist um, teaches a person how to walk again. 17, if the resident is unhappy with their meal, the nurse aide should tell them that the meal was ordered by the doctor, tell them that this is the only meal available, offer them, offer to get them something different, or D, reassure them that the next meal will be better. And the best response is going to be C, offer to get them something different. Just make sure that whatever the alternative is, that it still follows their diet order. 
18, the resident is hard of hearing and is continually turning on her call light. The CNA should report the resident to the charge nurse. B, put the call light outside of the resident's reach. Never do that. C, stop responding to the call light. Or D, listen to her carefully to determine her needs. And we know what the best response is going to be. It's going to be B, listen to her carefully to determine her needs. And as a good caregiver, you're always proactive. And so I will usually let my, my patients and residents know, you know, hello, Miss Lucas. Um, is there anything else I can get for you? Because I have to go see my other patients now. And it may be a few minutes before I can get back to you. What else can I get for you now? And that way I can get the whole laundry list of everything they need. I'm being proactive. I put it all in their room. And that will usually stop them from calling you so much. 19. A resident tells the CNA something confidential about her family. The CNA should not tell anyone else. B. Report the information to the charge nurse. C. Tell the other staff members. D. Tell the social worker. And the answer is a, not tell anyone else. Now, if it's something, you know, uh, involving abuse, we are mandatory reporters. You would want to tell the nurse that. But if it's just something gossipy, <laughs> something that's not going to impact patient care, just keep that to yourself. Don't be telling everybody's business. 20, OSHA. Okay, OSHA regulates um, safety. So OSHA regulations specify the following must be worn while washing out soiled linens. <sighs> Don't just think that you're working in the hospital. There are assisted living facilities, there are home care. And so let's say your patient had a large bowel movement in the bed and um, they are a home care client and you are the CNA who takes care of them in their home. You don't get to throw out their sheets. You don't get to wait for the laundry department because the laundry department is non-existent. You are the laundry department. So according to OSHA, what must be worn when you're washing soiled linens? Um, A says an April and gog goggles, B says gloves and goggles, C gloves, or D just goggles. And I learned something new. The answer is B, gloves and goggles, okay, in case there's some backflow or something, some backflash. 21, when answering an intercom call from a resident, you should A, ask them what they want. B, give your name and position and say, how may I help you? C, tell them someone will be with them in a moment. D, ask them to call back later because you are busy. And so the best response for this one when someone's calling is you're going to give your name and position and say, how can I help you? Hi, this is Nurse Eunice. How can I help you? 22, you are giving mouth care on an unconscious resident. What is the best response for the, what is the best position for the resident to be in to prevent aspiration? A, a supine position, B, a Fowler's position, C, with the head turned to the side, D, laying on the back. An unconscious resident is at risk of aspiration. So you don't want them in, actually, you don't want them in a supine position, never, um, especially if you put something in their mouth. And even if you sit them upright in a Fowler's position, because they don't usually have a gag reflex, any excess fluid from the oral swab that may get into their mouth can actually travel down to the back of their throat. So when you are providing oral care to, a, to an unconscious resident, the best answer is to have the head turned to the side, or you can actually just put them in a side lying position while you're providing the mouth care. And then that way all the secretions can actually go into the cheek area and you can either suction them out or take like a tongue depressor and a washcloth and um, dry it out that way. Remember, your test is not geared toward one particular population. So I will not assume that you have suction equipment. If you're in home care, you probably won't. 23, a resident is speaking about her fear of dying. How should the nurse aide respond? A, she should tell the resident not to be afraid. B, she should ignore the resident and change the subject. C, she should tell the resident maybe she isn't dying. Dying. D, she should listen to the resident and ask questions only when appropriate. And if somebody's talking about having a fear of dying, your best response is going to be 
D, listen to what they're talking about and ask questions only when appropriate because her fear could actually be valid. You know, somebody could be 35 years of age with three kids at home and they could have just received a terminal diagnosis. Her fears are valid. What's going to happen to my kids when I die? So you being a good CNA and listening and listening with compassion is going to, you know, help that patient. You may not be able to prolong their life, but maybe there's something you can say or some, um, you know, something you can relate to the nurse so that we can get assistance for this particular patient. 24, do not take an oral temperature on a resident if they have eaten or taken fluids in within the last how many minutes? A is 10 to 20, B is 30 to 40, C is 20 to 30, and D is 50 to 60. A good rule of thumb for me is about 15 minutes, so the best answer is going to be A. If you take a temperature um, on a patient after they have eaten or drinking, after they've eaten or drink, excuse me, then of course the temperature would have been altered by whatever was in their mouth last. And so if it was something cold, the temperature is going to be low. If they had drinking coffee, it's going to give a false high reading and you might assume the person has a elevated temperature. So give their mouth, their mouth time to rest before you take the temperature. We're halfway done, everybody. 25. Mrs. Jones is asked to see, Mrs. Jones is asking to see a priest. The nurse aide should. Tell other CNAs of Mrs. Jones' request. B, Mrs. Jones, excuse me, B, tell Mrs. Jones she needs to wait until the next service. C, report Mrs. Jones' request to the charge nurse or social worker. D, ignore Mrs. Jones. She is just upset. Yep, and we have some great CNAs out there. So we know that you're going to report her request to the charge nurse or social worker so we can get that priest to come in. 26, which of the following is an example of objective information? Objective is more factual, something that can actually be proved versus subjective is based off of feeling. So what can I see? What can I prove? And um, Mr. Blake looks mad. Or is that just his normal facial expression? <laughs> B, Mr. Blake is six foot tall. I can actually take a ruler and I could confirm that. Mr. Blake is too fat. Based on whose standards? Mr. Blake seems unhappy, or excuse me, Mr. Blake seems happy today, but maybe he was also happy yesterday, but you didn't see him. So the best response is going to be B. <laughs> Um, everything else is too subjective and it's based off of the person who's looking. It's based off of their feelings or, you know, their prejudices, etc. cetera. Um, but something that will be more factual is this person's actual height. So B, Mr. Blake is six feet tall. That is an objective assessment. 27, when brushing a resident's hair, you should start at A, the scalp, B, the ends of the hair, C, the back of the head, D, the front of the head. And for my educators out there who may be watching my videos, for my future educators, because our CNAs, they go far. They go from being a CNA to being the nurse. If you have a different or a coarse hair texture, I um, want to encourage you to allow others to touch your hair. How are they going to know how to take care of an African-American who has locks in their hair if you never allow them to touch your hair? So um, the best answer for this one is going to be whenever you're brushing a hair, you always want to start at the ends of the hair. But do realize that when someone has locks or braids in their hair, you usually don't brush that you style it and so learning how to take care of hair um, of different textures and different types is really important and speak to your nurse and educator um, if you have any questions about how to take care of a particular hair type all right so we know 27 is going to be b you start at the end and detangle and work your way up 28, if a resident is having a seizure, you should. And a seizure is when they're having those involuntary um, convulsions, the movements, and um, they could injure themselves during their seizure. So the answer, excuse me, the answer options, if someone's having a seizure, you should A, place a cold washcloth on their forehead, B, hold the resident down to prevent injuries, C, get the resident a cup of water. D, move any furniture out of the way. When someone's seizing is involuntary, they're thrashing about. What you want to do to keep that person safe 
especially if they're on the floor, is you want to do D. You want to move any furniture out of the way because it's going to be harder for them to hurt themselves if you have moved everything. Don't try to hold them down. Allow them to have their seizure. If their head is hitting the ground, you can put a pillow or purse or something beneath their head um, to provide some sort of cushion. And of course, if they're seizing in a bed, like in a hospital setting, we usually have paddings or um, blankets, pillows that we can put against those rails to prevent injury. 29, Mrs. Watson is talking about her headache. The CNA keeps looking at her watch. What message does that send to Mrs. Watson? A, her pain is not important. B, you care more, excuse me, you care about her pain. C, you have time to listen to her. D, you're interested in what she has to say. All right, so if you're looking at your watch, the whole time the patient's telling you about her pain, it's going to be A. She's going to feel that her pain is not important to you. So remember, active listening and active communication. Make your patient a priority. 30. Which healthcare team member is responsible for a resident's discharge planning? That means we're helping to send this person to their next level of care, which could be a nursing home. It could be back home. It could be to a rehab center. And so, um, the person who's responsible, the options are A, the director of nursing, B, the RN or the registered nurse assigned to that person's care, C, the dietitian, or D, the unit clerk. And um, this answer is going to be the RN. And as a nurse, we work with a multidisciplinary team. So we take the input of all these other um, specialists, such as the case manager, who has helped to coordinate some of this care. But at the end, I'm the one who's calling the report to um, Susie's nursing home to let them know that, hey, you're receiving patient ABC. They need this um, set up whenever they get there or if they're going home, I'm also starting that chain also to make sure they have the DME or the durable medical equipment they need, such as their walker when they're home. So for this particular, um, the answer, the answers that we had, the RN would be the one who's responsible for the discharge planning. 31, Mr. Blake says, I don't want to die until I speak to my son. He is in what stage of dying? A, bargaining, B, anger, C, acceptance, or D, denial. And you're going to see some of these patients just hold out, hold out, hold out, um, you know, until a family member actually arrives. And then once that family member arrives, um, and we're usually talking about a person who has a DNR order, which means do not resuscitate. Once that person arrives, that last family member they've been waiting for, that's when they will usually go ahead and, you know, have their last breaths. But we usually call that bargaining. Right. So, you know, we don't know what's going on, you know, outside or I should say inside, but they are just going to be waiting, you know, bargaining. You know, is my son coming? Is my son coming? And your job as a caregiver is, you know, especially if you're a nurse, is to notify those appropriate fa family members and try to get those last few remaining family members there to the hospital or nursing home as soon as possible. 32, when giving a bed bath to a resident, you should A, use soap on the face, B, put the dirty towels on the floor, C, keep the resident covered as much as possible, D, keep the bed in the lowest position. And the correct answer for this one is going to be C, keep the resident covered as much as possible. When you're giving a bed bath, don't keep the bed in the lowest position because that's not safest for you. Um, you want to use good body mechanics. So you usually raise that bed up to a working height. We're not going to put any dirty towels on the floor and we're definitely not going to put any soap on a resident's face. 33, an indwelling catheter drains the bladder of A, blood, B, urine, C, feces, water. So whenever you think about the bladder, you're thinking about the urinary system. So the bladder is going to have urine stored inside of it. So whenever that nurse inserts that catheter, urine should be flowing out. The best answer would be B. Okay, so tuberculosis. Um, tuberculosis is usually a, an airborne disease. And so tuberculosis is a disease, excuse me, tuberculosis is a disease of the A, kidney, B, stomach, C, 
lungs, D, heart. And the answer is going to be C, lungs. Whenever you're at your facilities and they're having you fit tested for your N95 mask, that's usually to prevent to prevent a droplet or airborne, um, a airborne, I'm going to say bacteria, such as tuberculosis. And again, the answer would be C. 35, paraplegia is the paralysis of A, arms and neck, B, lower part of the body, including the legs, C, legs and arms, D, upper part of the body. So when someone is paralyzed and they have um, paralysis, uh, we usually, if it's the lower half of the body, including the legs, we'll say they're paralyzed. So that would be the paraplegia. When we say hemoplegia, that's like half of the body. So that's going to be after a stroke. Um, and if someone is um, a quadriplegic, that's when usually the legs and the arms are all paralyzed. 36. Vital signs. QID means to record vital signs. Vital signs. QID means to record vital signs how frequently? A is four times a day. B is once a day. C, every hour. D, morning and evening. And the correct answer is going to be A. You're going to record those vital signs four times per day. And the way I like to remember QID is I think a quad. And quad canes usually have four points. So usually if I see Q in medical um, terminology or a medical abbreviation, I just kind of think of four. Okay, so four times a day is what QID means. 37, and this is pretty much based on your facility, <laughs> um, but for this particular question, 37, a partial bed bath means that you wash A, the face, neck, arms, and back, or B, the face, arms, hands, and chest, C, the face, hands, axilla area, which is the armpits, buttocks, and genitals, or D, Face, underarms, hands, and buttocks. And we do apologize for some of the typos. Remember, I make a much better nurse than I do a secretary. All right. And so for this one, the answer is C. Face, hands, axilla, and then also the buttocks and the genitals. But this is pretty much based on where you work and what was last provided to the patient. Because if at 10 p.m. the patient got a complete bed bath, but they vomited at, you know, 2 a.m., I'm not going to go back and clean their genitals unless their genitals are wet. I'm going to focus on their face, their neck, their hands, or the part that was impacted by the vomitus. And so again, this is the correct answer for this particular test, but in the real world, use your real knowledge so you're not duplicating your, you know, your work or you know, making your patient have their genitals bathed unnecessarily. 38, Mrs. Watson has lost her dentures. What would be the best food choice for a resident without teeth? A is a hot dog, baked beans, corn on a cob, and ice cream. Must be summertime in Florida. B is baked fish, whipped potatoes, squash, souffle, and pudding. C is fried chicken, green beans, cornbread, and pumpkin pie. And yes, I had to say it like a southerner. D is meatloaf, whipped potatoes, green beans, and baked apple. Well, it has to be something that's going to be soft. So even though I don't like the combination... The answer is going to be B, baked fish, whipped potato, squash souffle, and pudding, because all of those items should be something that would be easy to chew without teeth. They can chew with their gums or, you know, it'd be easier for them to swallow. 39, which of the following is not a definition of joint movement? Abduction is when you take something away. Flexion is when you bend something. Extension is when you straighten a, a, a joint. So for this one, the correct answer is going to be D, none of the above, because all of these refer to muscle movement. All right, only 10 more to go. You all are doing a great job. If you haven't already liked this video or subscribed to our channel, go ahead and do so. Remember that Florida Train Academy is a nurse-owned safety and medical company, so we appreciate viewers like you. Number 40, before entering a resident's room, the nurse aide should 
A, call out the resident's name and then walk in. B, knock and ask for permission to come in. C, check the name on the door. D, check to see if the door is locked. And when I'm teaching my classes, a shocking moment, I ask my students, can their residents, can their patients have sex? And the younger students are all like, no. <laughs> well, the answer is yes. You know, if the party is all coherent and consenting, consenting, the answer is yes. My follow-up question to that is, do you want to see it? <laughs> and 100% of students always say no. So the way that you're going to protect your residents, protect your patient's privacy, is you're going to be knock on the door first and ask permission before you come in. Okay, save your eyes. 41, the most likely emotion a resident with Alzheimer's disease would express is an Alzheimer's disease. Remember, this is late stage memory loss. Okay, um, they would be experiencing could be a fear, B, anger, C, confusion, D, all of the above. How would you feel if everything was unfamiliar that the person who's sitting next to you is saying they're your wife, but you don't recognize them. And then you keep trying to leave and people say, hey, you can't leave. So sometimes they can feel all of these emotions, fear because they're frightened. They don't know who you are. Anger because everyone's telling them what they should and should not be doing. And then B, confusion. So the best response is going to be D, all of the above. 42, if a CNA is feeling angry or frustrated, she should. A, this isn't an option, but what I want to say to my CNAs and my nurse buddies is if you're feeling angry or frustrated, don't frustrate anybody else's day. Let's just start there. But that wasn't one of the answer options. <laughs> so A, you should talk to her family about her feelings. So this is what she should do. She should talk to her family about her feelings. And B, she should stop caring um, so hard to handle resistance. C, she should talk to her supervisor. D, she should talk to other staff members. And if a CNA is feeling angry while he or she is at work, um, please recommend that he or she go speak to the supervisor because we don't need too much negative energy <laughs> around us. But then maybe the supervisor, you know, can give her some extra assistance. Um, most of your companies will have employer assistance programs. I think it's called EAP. And so they include mental health resources. Sometimes people are having problems finding a child care for their kids. They could be going through a divorce. And so we do understand that you all have life stressors outside of your stressful work work environment. So please speak to somebody so that you can get that assistance. 43, the Heimlich maneuver is used for A, beating the heart, C, getting air into the lungs, C, someone who is coughing, D, choking. And this one's a little confusing because we use the words choking interchangeably when someone is actually coughing. So if someone is coughing, that could mean they have a partial air obstruction. It doesn't mean they're choking. If they're coughing, you want to encourage them to cough because maybe they can clear their own airway. But at the point where someone has, you know, look of doom on their face, there is no air, air exchange and no coughing. Most Americans know to make the universal choking sign by putting their hands up to their throat. That is when you're going to step into action and perform the Heimlich maneuver, which we currently refer to as abdominal thrust. So the answer is going to be D, choking. Remember, if someone's coughing, you encourage them to cough. You don't do the Heimlich maneuver for someone who is still coughing. 44, Mr. Jones does not want to go to bed. You should A, make Mr. Jones go to bed. B, tell Mr. Jones it's time for bed and put him in bed. C, let Mr. Jones stay up and ask if he would like to talk. D, tell Mr. Jones the doctor says it's time for bed. Mr. Jones has rights, you all. He's not a kid. You're going to let Mr. Jones stay up and ask if he would like to talk. And the unit secretaries absolutely hate this. You have 15 patients and Mr. Jones wants to talk. Who's at the nursing station who can talk with him? Huh? 
the secretary, put him in a wheelchair, wheel him right on out there with the secretary. Just joking. No, I'm not. But speak to your chargers to see what can be done. Because yes, he wants to talk. He's not ready to go to sleep, but your time is limited. So, you know, do check on him frequently uh, because we don't want him to try to get up, you know, uh, and, and if he does become quiet, go check on him. Because usually if a person who's up, who's active, if they get too quiet, that could be a sign that something, you know, unfortunate has happened, such as a fall. 45, as a resident has been physically abused, you may see signs of withdrawal and marks or bruises, overeating, confusion and anger, or D, refusing care. And so if somebody has been physically abused, if they've been hit, they may withdraw, they may move away from you, or you may see marks and bruises. 46, which of the following statements is true of long-term care? A, long-term care patients are never able to return home. B, most conditions in long-term care facilities are chronic, meaning that the resident has had this condition for a long time. C, all residents in long-term care facilities are mentally, excuse me, terminally ill. And then D, long-term care is the same as home care. And the correct answer is going to be B. Most conditions in long-term care facilities are chronic. For example, um, Miss Maggie is unable to see how much insulin to give herself, and she's a diabetic. And um, she's not able to use the insulin pen because she has arthritic hands. And that would mean that she wouldn't be safe to be at home because she can go into a diabetic coma. She cannot manage her chronic disease, her diabetes, and that would be a reason that she would be referred to a long-term care facility. 47, the ombudsman is a person who A, helps with the activities in a facility, B, directs admissions at the facility, C, is a legal advocate for the resident and helps protect the resident's rights, D, helps with career counseling. And so the ombudsman is a legal advocate. They help protect your resident's rights. 48, when speaking to a resident or their family, a CNA should A, not use medical terms, B, not listen to what the resident or the family has to say, C, have the charge nurse speak to the family, D, use advanced medical terminology. And that was an easy one. You're not going to use medical terms. For example, you're not going to walk into the room and say, hi, Miss Mathis, my name is Susie, I'm your CNA, and I'm not able to give you any water because you're NPO. <laughs> it's you want to actually explain what that means. Your doctor has said you can't have anything to eat or drink. And according to the notes, it says you have surgery tomorrow. And as a CNA, you may not know the type of surgery. That is something you can defer to the nurse. Well, your nurse will be in shortly. That's what you can tell the resident. However, you are responsible for knowing those diet orders, and you don't want to be speaking above your you know, resident's um, level of knowledge. So don't use medical terms. Speak in full sentences, okay? 49, which of the following shows that you are listening carefully to a resident? A, standing over a resident, that could be quite intimidating. B, checking your watch frequently. C, looking out the window. D, sitting beside the resident, leaning forward and looking at them, making eye contact. <laughs> so the best um, option when you're trying to show that you're listening carefully is going to be D, okay? Remember when you're standing over your patients, it can make them feel intimidated. Number 50, which is not an example of ab abuse or neglect. A, leaving a resident in wet pants. B, helping a resident file a complaint. C, telling a resident she cannot have lunch if she does not have, if, if she does not take a shower. And then D, not answering a call light. So which is an example, which is not, excuse me, an example of abuse or neglect. And the one that is not is going to be B. 
And, and I'm assuming that you are helping the person file this complaint because maybe he or she can't read, can't write, but make sure that you also notify your nurse. And this was the option given for the questions. And so this is the best option with what we had to work with. So guess what, everybody? You all have completed 50 practice CNA exam prep questions. I am so proud of you. We have playlists that contains that contain hundreds of practice questions and also clinical skills videos. And um, we wish you much success. Again, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, go ahead and do so. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. 